Hi and welcome to Destination Michigan. We're here to explore the beauty, creativity, and destinations in our Great Lakes state. Tonight we'll meet some outstanding Michiganders and we'll travel across the mitten to visit the communities that make Michigan unique. Tonight's journey will launch in Leland where we'll meet the pilot behind a bright yellow Piper Cub seaplane. Then if you're a stargazer but don't want to wait for the sun to go down, we'll introduce you to your next daytime destination, the Longway Planetarium in Flint. In this episode, we'll also meet a whimsical craftsman from Sanford, and we'll visit the Gilmore Car Museum in Hickory Corners. Plus, we'll learn about the Midlands Creative 360 Art Program that honors artists ages 80 and older. I'm Courtney Jerome, and you're tuned in to Destination Michigan. Support for Destination Michigan is provided by the CMU Bookstore. T-shirts, sweatshirts, hats, maroon and gold memories, and an official outfitter of Adidas apparel at the Central Michigan University owned and operated CMU Bookstore. Online shopping seven days a week at cmubookstore.com. The CMU Bookstore, online at cmubookstore.com, on campus in the University Center, and game day locations at Kelly Short Stadium and the CMU Events Center. If you're a fan of airplanes, then you're probably familiar with Cessna. But for those of us a little less versed in flight, Cessna is best known for small piston-powered aircrafts. And the fourth largest Cessna single-engine sales affiliate in the world is in, you guessed it, Michigan. The Cessna Michigan affiliate is Suburban Aviation, owned by Tom Trumbull. Now, although their airport is based just north of the Ohio border in Ottawa Lake, the Trumbulls live in the northern Michigan town of Leland, where the family flies for fun. Many locals and summer residents of the M22 part of our state have gotten a glimpse of a small but bright yellow plane flying through the clouds and landing in the lakes. If you're like me, you might have also wanted to know more about who's behind the pilot seat and where they're headed. So we went in search of that seaplane and found it. The pilot is Tom Trumbull, and he commutes from his home in northwestern Michigan in Leland to his airport in southeastern Michigan. And we've been in that business since um, 1984. Kind of got our start in, in aviation through my dad. He was a pilot, so I got, I got a chance to learn how to fly at a very young age. I think my dad practically moved a household of furniture in this uh, airplane. But that's kind of how we got started here, and we'd always had seaplanes. Over the years, we used to go up into Canada and, and float planes like, like this. Oh, I don't know, maybe 10, 12 years ago, he said, you know, we need to get a Cub on floats. And I said, yeah, I think we do need to do that. So anyways, we, we found uh, the airplane, we found the, the set of pontoons for it, and put it together put a little bit bigger engine in, in the airplane and it all came together. So it's just been a, a kind of a toy airplane, but it's just great fun to be able to see the area. On his 16th birthday, he flew his first airplane solo. Today, he docks his seaplane on the shores of Lake Leelanau. views from above sure are beautiful. This airplane, this is a 1946 Piper Cub. 
So this airplane was designed to be a, a trainer. For World War II, a lot of the pilots did their primary training in an airplane like this. It originally had a very small engine, but, but most of them were produced with a 65 horsepower air-cooled engine. We converted this one to a 90 horse, which it doesn't go any faster, but it, it gives you better takeoff and climb performance. So this airplane, you know, on a, on a cool day without a lot of weight, just maybe you're by yourself, you can land in pretty small places and you can always land in a shorter, a smaller area than taking off. So that's a little bit of a thing you got to keep in mind. It's like when you look at a, a lake and you think, uh, okay, I know I can land there, but can I get out of that lake again? So that's, uh, that's a little bit of a challenge, yeah. In Tom's Piper Cub, the pilot flies from the back seat. It doesn't have an electrical system, so there aren't any lights, which means daytime only flying. And there aren't any brakes either, so it can be difficult to steer on the water when the airplane always wants to point into the wind. The trickiest thing, uh, understanding how the airplane handles on the water. In a land plane, since you're relegated to runways, you often have a crosswind takeoff or landing where the wind is not coming straight down the runway, but it will be at an angle. In a float plane, since the runway is, is the whole lake, you pretty much can always land and take off into the wind. Now, once you get on the water, we uh, pull the water rudders up, which steer it on the water, and the airplane automatically weather vanes right into the wind. Having uh, some experience on a sailboat is really useful because you're really tuned into the wind and, and its effects. We've always thought that that was the best training time on a sailboat. And Tom has been training future pilots for years, both with his suburban aviation business and at home. One of his sons flew solo on his 16th birthday too. And Tom's also currently teaching his daughter the freedom of flight. This aviation thing, I think, you know, uh, in our family is we take it for granted a little bit, you know, because it's just the way we, we've always had airplanes around. And, you know, that's kind of the, the thing that we've noticed in our business that we analyze our business in terms of what do we do? Which sometimes you can get so deep in business that you, you don't take time to say, you know, what are we doing here? And we realize that, that what we do is we show people how to integrate aviation into their lifestyles, sort of like we did. If it's over a two hour drive, we fly. What we find is the people that, that buy airplanes from us, they have all sorts of missions. It might be uh, using the airplane for business. It may mean that they have a summer home in Northern Michigan and they commute back and forth by airplane. It could be that they've got kids in college and they're they're going back and forth. So everyone's got a little bit of a mission. So how do you then integrate that into your lifestyle and then understand the whole aviation thing with the owning the airplane and maintaining it and, and all those things that go along with owning an airplane. And that that's really defined our business nicely and what we do. The Trumples also have a set of skis for their Piper Cub, so they can fly off the snow and ice. Tom explained to us that most people learn how to fly a seaplane after they have a single-engine private land plane license. Then, in around two days' time, pilots can add on to their license and fly a seaplane. To learn more about some training services, visit SuburbanAviation.com. Now, unless you're living far away from a large Michigan city, chances are your view of the night sky isn't as bright as it could be. Destination Michigan's Stephanie Mills takes us to the state's largest planetarium, where the sky is not the limit. If you love looking up at the stars but don't want to wait for the sun to go down, then look no further than the Longway Planetarium in Flint. A lot of the people live, like I said, in big cities or even small towns now. There's lights everywhere. I can show you what the night sky is supposed to look like. And when you turn off all the lights and turn the stars on and you hear, and it's not very loud, you have to know what you're listening for, and you hear that. <sighs> Leaving you breathless is one way to describe the feeling you get when you take in a show at the Longway Planetarium. And given its huge size, there's no shortage of amazement here. Longway Planetarium is the largest planetarium in the state of Michigan. 
60 feet in diameter and from the bottom of the dome up to the very top inside is 40 feet. We have a Digistar 2 digital star projector and over 70 slide projectors and video projectors in the dome that create all the visuals that you see during the programs. The Longway Planetarium opened in June of 1958. It seats 282 people and is an ideal place for kids to open up their minds and imaginations. We got to come along as these elementary school children went on a treasure hunt through space. It's a treasure map. Ooh, look at all the arrows. Why don't we go on a space treasure hunt? Yeah! Oh, wouldn't it? They have so much fun following along, they don't even realize how much they're learning. That atmosphere stretches into these classrooms located inside the main building where kids get down and dirty learning about science. Our education staff does a great job of offering that kind of programming. Again, to, to supplement the classrooms, to help the teachers. When you see some of the classes that we do here and the mess that is left when the kids leave, you can understand why the teachers might not want to do it in their classroom, but we're set up to do that kind of thing here. And it, it just helps to extend the school day. It helps to extend what the kids can learn. While education is at the heart of the experience at the planetarium, for some, it's also sort of like a match made in heaven. A lot of people think Longway Planetarium is just for school field trips. One of the most fun things we do here, weddings under the stars. People actually get married in the planetarium dome with all the lights turned off and nothing but the stars overhead. And it is probably the most unique place you can ever imagine to do a wedding. To be under the dome is all about helping you get an idea of what lies above and beyond our planet. Most people don't live where it's dark anymore. Most people live someplace where there are lots of lights outside at night and all you see is the light pollution and maybe a few bright stars. Well, in the planetarium, we turn all the lights off. We make it dark and we show people what the night sky would look like if you didn't have any light pollution. And if you weren't able to take in a show here, the Planetarium crew has a great way to bring the stars to you. A couple of years ago, we purchased a portable dome theater. We don't call it a planetarium because we do more than just star shows, but it's basically a portable planetarium that we can take out to the schools. While Richard's passion for painting the clearest picture of the night sky is very obvious, it's the infiniteness of space that keeps his eyes to the skies all the time. The one thing that people really need to know about space is that it is big. It's far bigger than anybody can even imagine. New discoveries are being made every day. Every single day we're, we're finding out more and more about what's out there in the universe around us and it's hard to keep up. If you want to know what's up in the sky, come to the planetarium. The Longway Planetarium offers many unique shows for people of all ages. Check their website, longway.org, and click on Planetarium for upcoming shows and events. Well, our next visit tonight is at a small business in Sanford, just northwest of Midland, to learn about the unique style of DRL wood and metal crafts. Trace, cut, and perfect. That's the process Dave Loomis repeats when he builds his one-of-a-kind birdhouses and bird feeders. His variety of feeders hold anything as small as thistle seeds to as chunky as suet cakes. Some of Dave's bird feeders are so true to his unique style that they even feed the birds in a unique way, with peanuts and jam. Orioles, uh, they like the jam. Uh, we use grape jelly for them. They also, they like the oranges. They like that sweet, sweet stuff. <laughs> Dave's birdhouses are equally unique. They're wacky and whimsical and contagious, bringing a smile to your face. They just come together and make a face. I mean, that's kind of neat sometimes. You just don't know what, what you're actually gonna come up with until you got it all done. As you can see, some of his creations look like they're straight out of a children's book. They convey youth and color to yards across our state. But there's more to it than just the art behind his craft. Each house's whole size, height from the floor and ground, and its interior are all carefully planned out to protect particular birds. Most of your birds have to take a specific hole. The majority of them are 
inch and a quarter to inch, inch and three eighths. That's for your, pretty much your chickadees, your nut hatches, things like that. Bluebirds, they're a standard inch and a half, whole size. The cavity size is, it varies too from bird to bird. And it goes on up to your wood ducks. Uh, they take a large one. It just depends on what kind of bird you want to attract. And you can find all that on the internet. I mean, cavity sizes and hole sizes and everything. Now, most of the houses and feeders are created with cedar, like these with cedar roofs. And Dave uses other types of wood too, constantly recycling and not letting anything go to waste. If I'm out walking in the woods and I see something that might be unique, I'll grab that too. It just depends. Anything that's painted is painted on pine, and that handiwork is done by Dave's wife, Rosemary. The artistic duo travels the state to craft shows to sell their work. The nice thing about some of them is there's no, no two of them alike. They might look alike, but the pieces might, when you cut them out, you might make a little oops here, and you just sand it out, make it look good, put it together. The finished product is Watching that come together is what I really like. The Loomises are known to be at craft shows in West Branch, Farwell, Shepherd, and Bay City, as well as many other destinations in Michigan. They also sell some really fun kids' toys that sell out fast. If you'd like to know where they're headed next or to place a custom order, Dave can be reached by phone. Next up, we're making a stop just north of Kalamazoo at the Gilmore Car Museum in Hickory Corners. Stephanie Mills shows us that the museum brings the past back into motion with its one-of-a-kind classic car collection. Most people remember their first car. For me, it was a 1994 Chevy Corsica. It was the first car I wrecked after plowing it into a large pile of rocks. Fortunately, no one was hurt. And you won't see that car on display at the Gilmore Car Museum, but a visit there does have many reminiscing about their first loves, and it's not hard to see why. For the Gilmore Car Museum, you can get right up close to the cars. We like to see and get close to history. So you might walk up to a, a Corvette or um, some other particular car that the person walks up and sees that car and can think back of, oh, this is the car that I wanted when I was in high school, and when I finally got it, you know, I got my first parking ticket or my first speeding ticket. It brings back that memory that they can share with their kids. Bringing back memories is sort of how the car museum got its start. In 1963, founder Donald Gilmore's wife, Genevieve, bought him a 1920 Pierce Arrow to restore. His collection of antique cars got so huge that he soon realized he needed a bigger place to store all the vehicles he was working on. So he went about a mile north of his house down on Gull Lake and bought a couple farms and he divided off a 90 acre plot, put in about three miles of paved road, and that was just gonna be kind of a playground for he and his cars. Moved a couple barns that were on site and then thought, you know what, they kinda of look neat, maybe I'll build a, a shop that looks like a barn. And then he built an office and a display area that looked like a barn. Then he thought, why am I building replicas? So he went out and started finding barns and having them taken down board by board. Genevieve convinced Donald to share his collection with the community. They created a nonprofit, and three years after Donald got his first car, the museum opened to the public. It opened to the public in 1966, and they had the very first customer, um, we have a snapshot, very first customer's first name was Otto. I <laughs> think, isn't that, isn't that perfect? The first customer to an auto museum is named Otto. The museum began with 35 cars in its collection. Today, they display around 300, and they haven't just added vehicles either. Over the years, they've set up more barns and display areas on the gorgeous property, and that's not all. We've recreated a, a 1930s gas station, and now we've got several um, car dealerships that we've recreated. Uh, we've got where we're sitting right now is a 1928 Ford dealership. We've got a 1911 Franklin dealership. We're building a Lincoln from the 30s uh, and a Cadillac dealership from the 1940s. We've got a 1941 diner that came from the East Coast that's been completely restored and you actually go in there and get food. Our collection is so diverse. We're, we're so different than most car museums. With such a huge collection of historic and unique vehicles, you're guaranteed to see things at the Gilmore Car Museum that you won't find anywhere else. We have a 1938 Mercedes 540K 
which in and itself would be very rare, but this one they only built two of, and this one was hidden in a Dresden, Germany house in the basement for 60 years. And of course, Dresden was bombed during the war, so it's amazing it even survived. We also have a turbine car. It's a 1963 Chrysler turbine car. It was a concept that uh, Chrysler took around to auto shows. It's one of 50 ever built, but this could run on gasoline or jet fuel or peanut oil or tequila, any flammable liquid. The other vehicle they're going to see and go, wait a minute, I didn't know the history of that car. It's probably the Checker. The Checker was all, they all were built here in Kalamazoo. And look at this piece of movie magic, an area dedicated to Gilmore's connection to Walt Disney. The two were friends, and this is a set piece from the 1967 Disney movie, The No-Mobile. While preserving the past is a big part of the experience at the museum, the history helps inspire future generations. Education really is the key of the Gilmore Car Museum. We are probably the only car museum in the nation that allows student groups field trips to come for absolutely free. They also have mentors who work with kids to restore some of the classic cars, teaching them not only about the mechanics, but about respect and responsibility. We do that because we want to, one, expose the community to what we have here to offer, but it also uh, maybe shows them that, gosh, there probably is more at the car museum that we can show, you know, we can show not just history, but science and uh, mathematics. As you walk down memory lane here, taking in all the incredible displays, it's not hard to wonder what the future has in store for one of the greatest inventions of all time. We may be in the middle of nowhere, Hickory Corners. Maybe you have never even heard of us, but we are the fastest growing car museum in the nation and considered one of the top or premier car museums in the nation. So I would encourage people to take a little closer look and when they get down here, I think they're gonna be just really surprised. To learn more about the museum, its programs and current exhibits, log on to gilmorecarmuseum.org. Now, another Michigan nonprofit is a community-based arts organization called Creative 360. At their Midland location, they offer classes, workshops, and outreach opportunities for all ages. Destination Michigan's Bob Garner explores one of their programs that taps into their participants' legacies of creativity. The group of over 90 artists, scientists, and community leaders are 80 years old and older. Creative 360, which is in Midland, also one of my favorite towns, has one of the most talent-provoking programs I've ever seen. It's built around the arts, but it's also built around octogenarians. Now that's just a big word for someone in their 80s. And actually, some of the participants are well past their 80s. Everything from dance to poetry to music and more. Today, we're really enjoying our visit because we're looking at the paintings that have been done by these octogenarians. Carol Speltz is giving us an overview. Carol, isn't this exciting that, that folks that are at least octogenarians get a get a chance to find their voice through art? It's wonderful and we are delighted to be able to host this exhibit um, which features artists 80 years of age to 99. If any of them found out that they have a, have a gift that maybe didn't know it when they started? Many of the artists, um, when you listen to their stories and they share their experiences, didn't really become artistic or display their arts in some fashion until they were older. You know, I've never thought of myself as artsy in any way. This is uplifting. It is. It's, uh, it's a joy to be here. It's a joy to share. We hope that people will come and look at the art and appreciate what it represents and that they will also participate in other experiences through, through the gift of creativity, through the programs that are offered here. One of the paintings I really, really, really enjoyed was painted by Harold Cluck of Saginaw. Harold, how long have you been painting? Well, let me see now. Uh, about 24 years in the last shot. I did a little bit in high school, but you know, I really got into it after I retired. What got you into it? I really enjoy seeing beautiful scenery. I grew up on a farm and I just love seeing beautiful scenery. And when I'd see beautiful paintings that had to do with the outdoors, it really impressed me. So I just felt I would really like to be able to produce something 
like that that would be oh, and you did. beautiful. And well, you thank did. You. You, you've got a number of very beautiful things here, but I am completely smitten with that couple walking down the road in a little <laughs> village in the, uh, during the snow. Yeah. Where on earth did you get the idea for that? That is, that is a great piece of art. Well, uh, some of that, uh, you know, most artists see some symbol of what they're painting, you know. It's a, a kind of a, a project of mine now to put people more in my paintings than I used to. Of course, the key question, the most important question of all, the most important question. Are you having fun? Yes, 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 I certainly am. Here's a couple of fun ladies that you're gonna enjoy. Barbara and Gail, they're very much involved in Creative 360. If you look at the name of the program, what does it say? Yes, we can. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like, can we do this? Yes, we can do that. Can we do so and so? Yes, we can. And when you go from that premise, magic happens. <laughs> Creative 360 hosts art shops, galleries, and events throughout the year. If you're interested in getting creative with them, take a look at their website, becreative360.org. Now we'll conclude our episode with some Destination Michigan trivia for you. As you've learned in a previous episode, there's a handful of active mint farmers in our state, producing barrels of highly concentrated flavor. So our trivia question for you is, one 55-gallon barrel of mint oil can produce how many sticks of chewing gum? Stay tuned for the answer. Support for Destination Michigan is provided by the CMU Bookstore. T-shirts, sweatshirts, hats, maroon and gold memories, and an official outfitter of Adidas apparel at the Central Michigan University owned and operated CMU Bookstore. Online shopping seven days a week at cmubookstore.com. The CMU Bookstore, online at cmubookstore.com, on campus in the University Center, and game day locations at Kelly Short Stadium and the CMU Events Center. Our Destination Michigan trivia question for the night. One 55-gallon barrel of mint oil can produce how much chewing gum? The answer is 5 million sticks. It can also make over 100,000 tubes of toothpaste. Tom Ear's family has been producing spearmint and peppermint oils for five generations now in St. John's. They're one of the few mint farming families in Michigan. They sell their oil to companies such as Wrigley's and Colgate. So next time you have a bite of that unique flavor, keep in mind you might be tasting Michigan mint. Thanks for joining us tonight on Destination Michigan. We hope you'll tune in again and learn more about the state we all love to call home.